How are you doing today? <laughs> it's great to be here in Austin. I'm actually from Boston. I'm so glad to get away from the snow. <laughs> I'm so glad the weather's nice here in Austin. And it's my first time to South by Southwest. So this is a great, a great way to be here, I think. So um, I'm Cynthia Brazil. I'm going to be talking to you about robots. So I'm going to put up maybe my, whoops, I got to go back to my first slide here. So just a little bit about my credentials. I'm a professor at MIT, at the MIT Media Lab, where I founded and direct the Personal Robots Group. And I am also a founder and chief scientist of Jibo, so I have forayed into the startup world, and that is an adventure in its own right. <laughs> so it turns out I'm also a science fiction fan. And in fact, I love robot science fiction in particular. I'm sure some of you feel the same way. Um, and as it turns out, many of us uh, have been fascinated by robots for many, many, many years, long before we could actually build robots that are like the robots of our imagination. So of course we've been waiting. Even for me, I saw child, you know, Star Wars when I was a child, waiting, waiting. You know, when are these robots going to come into our homes, into our, our daily lives? Um, and I think the time is, is finally upon us. So I think we've all believed that it's not a question of if, but when, and how. And I will argue that in terms of the when, uh, you know, we're, we're, we are at this inflection point. And I think in many ways, because of the mobile computing revolution, because of the cloud computing revolution, and the drivers on that to make sensors, computation, wireless networking, really very high performance and cost uh, effective, it has allowed us to finally build sophisticated robots at a mass consumer price point. And that was really a key hurdle we had to get past in order to bring the physicality, the, the capability of personal robots into the home. But then the question is the how, which relates to what's the value proposition, right? What are robots going to do for us in the home that's going to make us want to welcome them into our homes, potentially even into our families? So that's what I want to talk about today. I certainly have my perspective on it, and it may be very different than how you think it might happen. So I want to share that, that perspective with you. So of course, there have been personal robots that have come into the home successfully. So back in 2002, there was the Roomba. And you could say that Roomba came into your home because of its relationship with dirt, right? It's kind of appliances that are getting smarter, more autonomous. And then more recently, in 2011, of course, we have the Nest thermostat, the learning thermostat. Now, you may debate whether this is a robot or not, but certainly technologies that are relevant to robotics, sensing, machine learning, decision making, and so you could argue that the Nest thermostat came into your home because of its relationship with air and energy, right? So, you know, when you think about the home, though, what are the first words that come into your mind? Is it, is it dirt? Is it air quality? Or is it family? Is it the people who live there? And given that, certainly for me, and I'm sure for many other people, the most important thing about the home is actually the family. Is it crazy to think that the personal robot's path into the home in a mass consumer way will be because of its relationship with the people who live there. And that's really been what my life's work has been about. So when I think about personal robots, for me, it's a profoundly social technology. And I began this work when I was a graduate student at MIT. It was literally the day that NASA landed a robot on Mars. And I thought, OK, let me get this straight. You know, we're sending robots into the depths of the oceans to explore, until volcanoes. And now we finally landed one on Mars. But where are they in our homes? When is that going to happen? But when you think about it, the complexity of designing an autonomous robot that can interact with people in the complexity of the homes, where people's behaviors, they're not just governed by laws of physics, you know, like rocks and so forth. Um, but by having a mind, by having thoughts, intents, beliefs, emotions, right? What would it mean to create a robot that can actually interact with people in a more human-centered way? And wouldn't that then motivate that a robot would need to be intelligent in ways we hadn't really thought of before? Robots would need to be socially intelligent. They would need to be emotionally intelligent so they could interact with us more richly, more fully, and more naturally. So that led me to my PhD work, and I developed the world's first social robot, Kismet, which you see here. <laughs> and that was really the robot that kicked off this field of this interpersonal side um, of social robots. And so when you think about this then, it kind of put a different perspective on 
the artificial intelligence questions, where now is about not just the cognitive side, but the social and emotive side as well. The robots would have to be able to do all these sorts of things. So when we think about the perceptual capabilities of a robot, it wasn't just about recognizing objects, right? It was about realizing that people were special things in the environment, you know, and you need to interact with people differently than you would say a desk chair, for instance. So how can you perceive people as people with these distinctly human qualities, like emotive expressions, what they're saying, their intentions, and so forth? When we think about the learning, you know, there's a lot of work today in kind of big data analytics, kind of offline learning, crunching a lot of numbers. But when you think about a robot in the home, people are going to want to be able to teach the robot to do things in a natural way, to have the robot personalized to them and adapt to them in a way that fits in with their life, right? So this more interactive, social, interpersonal side of almost teaching and learning as a collaborative process becomes important. So there's a different lens on the kind of machine learning question. When we think about how it moves, it's not just about the functionality of the physical task, but even how it expresses itself to you is important. In many ways, like interpersonal interaction, it reveals or helps reveal to you the internal states of the robot. So its behavior becomes much more understandable to you and, in fact, much more predictable to you. And that's important, especially when you talk about being able to collaborate or work with robots. And then finally, when you get to the interactional side, the decision making, maybe you'd call this kind of the, the core of the intelligence aspect, how it engages you, how it can understand your intention and coordinate its actions with you in order in understanding kind of what your goals are, your intentions, maybe even your, your feeling states, um, and how it can even build rapport with you. So you view it as a teammate or as a partner in a way that is, again, much more not only enjoyable, but more effective for you to be able to collaborate with that robot as well. So a very kind of different lens on the AI question. And so what I wanted to do today was focus this talk kind of on this intriguing intersection of social robots, artificial intelligence, and emotion. Now, when we think about the cognitive side, when we think about computers today, a lot of people are very comfortable saying that machines can think. They can perform cognitive tasks. They can play chess. They can plan these elaborate plane routes and so forth. We're comfortable kind of using this word thinking with machines. But this emotive side, it's new. It's provocative. It's, it's compelling, and it can also be controversial. So I thought I would spend some time kind of talking through how this area of robotics, uh, this emotive side came to be, to put this perspective on it, um, and to touch on what the implications of that in terms of robots and society. So, you know, the idea of putting emotive qualities into consumer robots certainly isn't new, right? When Furby came out in 1998, you know, this was, this was literally the time uh, I had, had been building Kismet, and I was freaked out because I read the Wired article, and it made it sound like they had put all of my dissertation in a $30 toy. <laughs> you know? So I went out and I bought two Furbies, and I turned them on, and I washed them. I'm like, OK, it's OK. It's OK. I can still get my dissertation. <laughs> Qualitatively and quantitatively different. <laughs> But Furby was a lot about expression, right? And certainly in terms of emotion, expression's part of that, right? But of course, in terms of a toy, it's all about children's projection, interpretation of that. You know, it's not necessarily anything underlying that's deeply affective um, in the sense when we think of the world of motion. You know, later on, again, as sensors, as technologies became higher performance and less expensive, we had more sophisticated entertainment robots coming onto the market. So there were robots like Ibo. Maybe if, uh, a few of you know this robot, Pleo, um, was designed to be a, a little robot dinosaur, a baby robot dinosaur. And here the focus was more now on these sort of emotive responses. So having the robot be able to sense through its cameras, through its microphones, through tactile sensors on its skin, and having these emotive responses to you or interactions with the environment in order to make Pleo seem much more lifelike, much more engaging. And of course, that's important for an entertainment robot, especially if it's leveraging this sort of almost pet-like um, interaction as part of its, its value proposition. But there's so much more when we think about emotion and why do we, as a species, why have we evolved such sophisticated emotions? It clearly is a much deeper, broader topic than just these sort of responses and expression. So as it turns out, there is a very deep and important interplay between our intelligence and the intelligence of other species, our cognitive capacities, and our emotions. And so I want to spend a little time talking about that and how that inspired a lot of this early work in AI and social robotics. So in 1994, Antonio Damasio is this very famous neuroscientist. He published a book called Descartes' Error that was very influential, I think, not only in the area of neuroscience, where for many years 
you know, people had been studying a lot about the cognitive, again, aspects of, of the human mind. The emotions really hadn't been explored with as much depth, and he came out with this really just this groundbreaking work that really showed this deep interplay of emotion and cognition. Both are required for our intelligent behavior. So it is with this sort of um, insight that emotions may actually be key to intelligence, and not only in our intelligence to be able to interact with other people, other social beings, but even in terms of having adapted responses under uncertain conditions with lots of complexity and uncertainty, that these were also the conditions upon which we evolved our emotional responses as a way of thinking. Um, so this became a very important influencer in this early work of AI, where when we think of feelings, of course, this is the kind of internal experiential side of it, and the emotive expressions are the public outwardly expressions of it. There's this other scientific term, this emotional effect, and again, it is this emotional effect that is what influences, allows these affective factors to influence our cognitive factors as well. So Don Norman talks about this emotional effect as almost being this sort of judgment system, right? Whereas the cognition deals with facts, such as kind of like the what is it, I like to think of um, the affective system as being kind of like the so what, you know, what's the meaning of this? Is this thing good for me or bad for me? Should I engage this thing or not engage this thing? It really makes that fact turn into personal relevance, and you can imagine why that is so important in making decisions, um, what we learn, what we decide to act and do. So this judgment system is a really important idea. It turns out that our affective systems provide feedback into our cognitive systems, often serving to align our decision making to be congruent with our emotional states, especially in times of stress, in times of great uncertainty, where you don't have a lot of information to be able to cogitate over things. Um, and it has a pervasive influence in terms of how we perceive things, in terms of decisions or attitudes, um, which of course has a profound impact on our behavior. So it's with this sort of insight that maybe if we're not designing these systems with emotional attributes, we're actually not making them as capable um, as they need to be when they come into our world, the human world, the physical world, where it is this world of sort of uncertainty, unknowables, and so forth, where, again, the conditions upon which we, we evolved to have emotions ourselves. So Kismet was actually one of the first robots that started to computationally model mechanisms for behavior and decision-making um, that was, again, complementing these more traditional cognitive aspects with these effective aspects in terms of the intelligence and decision-making properties of the robot, but also its ability to interact with people. They're kind of part and parcel of the same, of the same architecture. So I'm going to just quickly kind of walk through it at a very high level so you get a little better sense of what I'm talking about. When you think about kind of the cognitive systems of a robot, a lot of these uh, early autonomous robots were inspired by models of ethology. So ethology is a study of how animals make decisions in the natural world. And from that, this whole area of behavior-based programming came about. And so the ideas in each of these boxes are actually whole constellations of processes so in the perceptual system, there's many different filters for how you perceive different states. You know, are there skin tone and people and objects and are there toys and so forth. So many hierarchical layers of different kind of perceptual systems. Um, the attention system basically serves to save all these perceptions I'm getting at the moment. Where should I focus my attention and have my interaction and behavior be about that one thing? Otherwise, there's just too much to pay attention to and interact with. The idea of these releasers are then essentially picking out the context behavior-relevant context. So say I may be seeing all these different isolated uh, perceptual features, but how do they combine and to create a context by which I know that a particular behavior and a particular goal is relevant? And so when we think about behavior, behavior is inherently not just an action. It is a set of behaviors that are goal-directed to achieve a certain relationship, a certain outcome with the environment. Um, the actions themselves then are things like motor skills, like walking, jumping, that may coordinate multiple degrees of freedom. And then those, of course, go down into actual motor commands, maybe audio commands if, if the robot's speaking. So this is kind of the general idea of the cognitive decision-making aspect of the robot. When we think about what's ordering you know, the goals of the system, for Kismet, we could layer in things that are like homeostatic drives. So for an animal, these would be things like hunger or thirst or needing to regulate temperature, right? So these are parameters that you have to kind of keep in this happy middle range to be in a state of well-being. So for Kismet, Kismet's a robot. It's food in some sense with certain kinds of stimulation, the ability to interact with objects, with brightly colored toys, things like that, the ability to interact with people, and the ability to rest. So in many ways, Kismet was being modeled after a young creature 
who actually was dependent on others, on people to help it satiate its goals through these homeostatic drives. And these drives are a factor that help to organize those underlying goal-directed behaviors. Now, when we started layering on affect, the judgment system, the affective appraisal system, receives inputs from all of these systems and actually tags it with sort of these assessments of valence, is this good or bad, arousal, how intense is this sort of thing, or even engagement, should I reach out and engage, interact with this thing, or should I avoid it? So this is sort of the judgment system of, of, the, of the robot. And then all of that would be distilled down into an overall net sense of affect that went into this emotional affect system, which would then go out and modulate bias all these other systems to coordinate the behaviors into what you might consider to be emotional responses that are adapted to the environment. So that's just kind of giving you an idea of how a system like Kismet would be organized. Where when you think about how you might map these emotional states onto this affective space, it might go something like this, where you have arousal, valence, and engagement. The affective appraisal system, again, all those things are being combined into this emotional affect, which is a point you can imagine in three-dimensional space, that's the state of the robot at that time. And that point can move over time to keep adapting the robot's responses to, to the environment. And using this whole paradigm, we could design then a whole range of different emotional responses, these adaptive emotional responses, that were really about achieving certain goals for the system. They weren't just about expression for expressive state, but they're really about regulating the robot's interaction with the environment, which, of course, for Kismet involved people. So that's how we really started thinking about these kind of emotional qualities, uh, emotional cognitive architectures uh, for robots. So I'm just going to give you some quick vintage videos of Kismet so you could kind of see how these behaviors uh, were enacted over time. So in this very first video, you have Kismet. The drive to interact with toys is actually the strongest. So that's coordinating a whole constellation of behaviors, like a search behavior, to try to find things that are brightly colored. So you see he sees it, he like perks up, that success upon finding a desired object, so that's positive valence, so he starts to look happy. It's the desired object, so he's starting to engage, he's starting to look, look, look at it and so forth. And now I come in and I actually pick it up. You see he has this attention look at me and he actually gets a little sad because I took away a desired stimulus. So you can get a sense of how the flow of these emotional responses are leading to these kinds of behaviors. This next one is a you know, situation now where the robot actually wants to interact with the person. And the person here is a little far away. The robot, again, is happy. It sees the person, but they're too far away. So it does a calling behavior. And the calling behavior is basically trying to lure a person in. But of course, as it's doing so, it's showing positive effect because it's sensing progress about that. So you see this other calling behavior that follows that, again, is showing more engagement, more excitement as you're getting closer, which of course serves to make you want to interact with the robot. And then this last little video, again, is between now Kismet and a person who's never interacted with Kismet before. And he's vocalizing now. And you can see, again, kind of how natural these interactions are and how engaging these interactions are. Can I show this? Mm -hmm. Hi, hello. Yeah, I want to show you something. This, yeah. is, this is a watch that my, this is a watch that my girlfriend gave me. Oh, hell. Yeah, look, it's got a little blue light in it, too. Like, I almost lost it this week. So again, the robot's not speaking English. It almost doesn't matter. It's sort of like a pre-verbal child in some sense, but it's responsive to the environment. It has these emotion responses that you know, people clearly can interpret and respond to. And for the robot, it's all about its success in some sense in regulating this interaction with people so it maintains, again, this kind of state of internal well-being. So again, very much inspired by kind of models of creatures and how creatures make decisions in, in a complex uh, dynamic world. So that's kind of touching on the cognitive aspects, but of course you could see part and parcel of that for Kismet was the social side. So emotion plus social is also a really important theme and how that not only leads to intelligent behavior but can serve to grow and broaden our intelligence through social learning and so forth. So this becomes a very important topic when you think about communication, when you think about collaboration and partnership, being able to coordinate states of mind, to be able to coordinate actions, and of course, learning, learning by imitation, learning through tutelage and so forth, whether a robot is teaching or learning, for that matter. So I want to spend a little time giving an example of, uh, on, on this topic. So robots are socially embodied in a social world with other people, right? And it turns out this is really a critical part of, um, uh, of, of an environment that allows us to think about you know, being, being a body right, with a mind in a context of other entities with like minds yields these associations right, between kind of the physical properties of the self, the way we move, and how others move. And if you can map your body onto others, 
now you have a chance in some sense to understand how the behaviors of others in the environment may map onto your own. And if you can understand the behaviors of others in your environment, you may be able to do the sort of you know, what if perspective taking game where you can imagine, well, if I were doing that sort of action in that context, this is what my goal might be. This is, might be what I might, my beliefs might be. This might be what my feelings might be. And that's a handle on to maybe extracting these internal states, these internal states like intense and so forth that again are critical to our social intelligence. And when we think about coordinating states of mind, this theory of other minds, this is really critical. So this becomes almost a handle, a strategy by which perhaps arguably we develop this capacity through infancy and potentially how robots could also develop this capacity. So this notion of imitation, this notion of body mapping, mapping a robot's body onto others, being able to have these almost mirror neuron-like processes, if you can do that mapping, if your motor responses almost serve a dual purpose to be able to also recognize those actions in others, then maybe you can start to not only learn from other people in terms of imitation, but maybe other things like empathy and bootstrapping other forms of social intelligence and social learning. So this is a very kind of powerful precursor. So I'm gonna show a quick video of how now another robot, Leonardo, which is kind of the successor to Kismet, goes through this process. So this first is an example of learning to imitate, so learning to imitate, learning to imitate facial expressions. And it again is modeled basically how theories of how we people during our infancy may be able to learn how to imitate through our interactions with caregivers. Where the premise is, you know, when you're born into the world, maybe you have these expressions, you can kind of, what's called motor babble, these, these facial expressions, but often it's our caregivers, it's our parents who initiate the imitation with the infant because they're trying to establish a rapport. But if you're now having an adult imitate the infant, the infant can take that data and start to learn this, this body map. And that's exactly the strategy that this virtual version of a robot Leonardo is doing. So there's a vision system that's tracking facial expressions. The robot is babbling and it notices when someone's part of their face, for instance, is contingent to the robot's own. And it's using that contingency to say, well, they're probably imitating me. I'm going to assume that they're imitating me. And so I'm going to start capturing that as training samples, which I can train a neural network. And this neural network basically creates this middle representation, this mirror neuron-like representation to say I can map now from visual coordinates of seeing a face to my own motor coordinates of how I can act to move my face in that configuration. So once it's learned this sort of intermodal representation through the neural network, now when you do a facial expression, the robot can do a search to match process to imitate it. So that's what you're seeing here, where now versus you can make a full facial expression, the robot can imitate one that it's trained on, but then also you can make a novel facial expression and the robot can imitate that as well. So the robots learn this body mapping process. So this is really intriguing because you can keep building on this, right? In the same way perhaps that our development goes, you can build on this. So if you can imitate, if you can do facial imitation, it turns out that there are these two kind of loops. There's these body effects loops. So there's one case of emotion where there's a situation you have an emotional state and that causes your body to express in a certain way. It turns out there's also a converse loop where just by putting yourself in that expression, for instance, just by smiling or laughing, it can serve to induce that affective state in you, to give you that kind of internal state. So we can leverage that dynamic in order to have a robot learn, say, a primitive form perhaps of empathy, right? So you can imagine this scenario where a person smiles, the robot first imitates that, induces that positive effect, and then associative learning principles can then tie that internal state of the robot to just seeing the face. So now the robot doesn't have to imitate it at all. Just seeing a person's facial expression of a smile induces the robot into a positive valence. And that's really intriguing, not only for, again, this you know, deeper understanding of the person's internal states, but for other kinds of learning. So I want to give you um, another example of, of a kind of social learning that leverages capability. It's called social referencing. We start to do this in our own childhood around 12 months of age, but of course we do this through adulthood as well. And basically what social referencing is, is what if you're confronted with a novel stimulus, a novel something, you don't know what to make of it, I've never seen it before, is this thing good for me or bad for me? Well, often seeing the person who you trust, you know, their reaction to it, you might learn to associate their effective response to this object to gauge your own behavior towards it. So it's a social learning of effect and attitude towards the social mechanism. So this is the robot Leonardo now in kind of its full glory and its full physical manifestation. And it's a little demonstration of this where the robot sees a novel toy. In this case, it's Cookie Monster. 
and it's being introduced by Matt. Leo, this is Cookie Monster. That's kind of loud. You can see there's a lot of nonverbal communication can you find going Cookie Monster? on, sharing of attention, understanding speech. Now, this first interaction is to make sure that the robot knows what the reference Leo, is, what the focus Monster of attention is. Very is. bad. And now Matt is communicating this affect, is very bad, Leo. right, through tone of voice, through his facial Cookie expression, Monster is very, very bad. through um, word choice. And you can see the robot picking up on that. He's a scary monster. He wants to get your cookies. And now he's starting to associate that with the focus of attention, which is Cookie Monster, right? And so he's like, oh, no, this Cookie Monster thing is evil. <laughs> uh, it's OK, Leo. Now you can, of course, okay relax, now. Leo. You can kind of perk him up. He's like, OK, good. OK, I'm all right now. Now it turns out he's previously learned that Big Berg is good through a similar interaction. So he's like, I want that thing. That, that's the good thing, right? So this is the memory of it. And then you bring back uh, the dreaded cookie monster. And Leo's like, oh, yeah, I remember that thing. I, I don't want that thing. Right? So again, a simple form of learning. But you can imagine how this can scale in the implications of social learning for, for robots. Right? So social plus uh, uh, emotion is also interesting, right? these emotive qualities. The last perspective I want to touch on and spend some time on now is this design stance. And so in 2005, Don Norman wrote a book called Emotional Design, where the overall premise is, is if you understand emotion and how it influences human behavior and decision making and experience, if you design products that really leverage that, not only do people like those products better, people are actually even more successful with those products. So again, it's applying this cognitive science perspective to making objects not only desirable, but even helping us be better with them, more successful with them. So it turns out around the same time, a similar idea was being explored now with social robots. And these are socially assistive robots, where the thought is, if you can design robots now that can support our human capacities through social support, through emotional support, can you actually show that by interacting with a robot, say, versus a flat screen device or something else that doesn't exhibit those properties, can you show that people actually do better? Are they actually more successful, for instance, learn better, maybe adhere to a diet and exercise program better? So that was the big question. So are people actually more successful with robots if robots exhibit these properties, right? So I want to give two examples of that. These are two studies that um, we did in my group. One is on the topic of health and wellness. And it's about behavior adherence. And now why did we choose behavior adherence? Well, we know that social support plays a really important role in successful behavior change. And this has been recognized by science, by medicine, and so forth. So in terms of a domain for a social robot, this was really intriguing, because it's a context for long-term engagement, long-term encounters, where social support should make a big difference with a measurable thing, which is behavior change. And the area that we wanted to look at, oh, so this is the other trend that motivates the work. When you look at chronic diseases in particular, where behavior change is spoken about uh, quite a lot in, 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 in medicine, we just have the situation where chronic diseases are increasing at a much faster pace than our ability to train doctors and care professionals. So there's this big gap. So we need technology or some way of helping us bridge this gap. Um, and so the question is, can technologies with these more social affective properties be more effective, right? So there's a real societal need for some kind of innovation in this area. So the idea was then, let's look at obesity. Let's look at weight management, because we know, first of all, that's a huge issue in the United States. And it is often a precursor to a number of chronic diseases later in life. So the idea was, what if you could build a little personal health coach robot that could live with you and motivate you and apply, again, this kind of social support that a personal health coach, a human health coach, would do, but in the convenience of your home, in your home. And of course, you can still see your doctor and so forth, but this is really about bringing that kind of support to you you know, in the convenience of your home. So I'm going to show you a video of a commercial version of this robot. This was not the robot we used in our studies, the early version of this. But this video kind of really gets the concept across. So this is Autumn, uh, produced by the company Intuitive Automation. Hi, my name is Autumn. I'm a personal weight loss coach. I will help you lose weight and keep it off forever. Autumn makes it easy to stick with a diet. It's easy because I'm here every day for support. She didn't need a new diet. She needed my help to stick with it. Autumn is the most effective weight loss technique we've tested. So this is Dr. Autumn Carolyn Povey. She collaborated with us on the project. Use. Autumn combines the best of what we do in the clinic with the support of having a coach at home every day. With my daily support, I help you reach your goals and keep the weight off. <laughs> Thanks. 
She creates an emotional bond that helps you not only lose, but more importantly, keep off the weight. So this is the idea. It's Autumn, it's a personal health coach, it's bringing in these social support properties that we learned and worked with Dr. Carolina Povian to understand how does she engage with her patients in order to provide them support in the office, right? Can we bring that to the home? So, of course, there's a question then is, you know, what kind of technology might be the more, most effective, and does the social embodiment as a robot really matter, right? That's like a, that's a, a, a kind of ever-present question in a lot of the work that we do with social robots. So we did a study in the Boston area where we deployed these weight management coaches into people's homes. So one was the physical robot, the social robot. We also deployed essentially computers that had the same dialogue, gave the same advice, did everything the same, except it was a computer, it wasn't a social robot, and so this was trying to test the social embodiment question. And then we just sent you know, the third condition with the standard of care, which was a paper log that Dr. Arpovian typically sends her patients home so they could record their diet and exercise, right? So, so which one helps the most? So it's intriguing, you know, the real intriguing question here is between the robot and the computer, right? So when we looked at engagement, so the amount of time used, even though the computer gave the exact same advice, had the same team building dialogue, social support dialogues as the robot, people used the robot a lot more. They were much more engaged with the robot than the computer. When we looked at standard measures, kind of psychological measures, um, on measuring the working alliance, so how much do people feel they're a team with these systems, people felt a much closer sense of working alliance with the physical social robot than the computer, so that's intriguing. People reported on other uh, uh, instruments, other surveys, that they trusted the robot more. Um, they found it more engaging, more interesting, more engaging to them. But one of the things that was really striking was, again, this emotional connection they felt to the robot. So they would name their robots. They would dress their robots. You saw that in the commercial. That's because people actually did this. They would put red socks hats on them and so forth. They would dress the robots. And even when we came to pick up the robots to bring it back to the lab, people would come out to the car and say goodbye to the robots. You know, and people would then say in interviews things about how, you know, this effective relationship, you know, this sense of appreciation, the sense of, um, uh, uh, Autumn was part of the family. You would hear this again and again and again. It was really intriguing. They would not talk uh, this way about the computer. You didn't see this kind of behavior at the computer. So again, this physical embodiment, this the social embodiment really makes a difference for people. So it's intriguing then to think about when we're in this world of Internet of Things, we have our devices, you know, maybe it's scales or fat monitors, measures or Fitbits or whatnot. On one side, your kind of network of things, and then you have your human network, of support, your doctors, your nutritionists, whatever. It's intriguing to think about these social robots as sort of the hub of that. They can help coordinate your information from your physical devices, but engage in this humanized way and help share that and coordinate that with, with your care provider network to enhance the human network that you have. I think it's a really intriguing idea. So the next thing I want to touch on is a very different area, so education, and with a very different age group, so with very young children. And it's the same kind of set of questions I, I, I want to explore here. So these kind of social effective properties in robots, and does that lead to improved, in this case, learning outcomes for children? So we know this is a big issue in the United States. And in fact, in the 2014 um, State of the Union Address, President Obama particularly called out the importance of early childhood learning, that too many children are not entering kindergarten ready to learn. And this is a real issue because science has shown if children don't even enter kindergarten ready to learn, it's very, very hard for them to catch up. So this is a huge challenge we have in the United States. We're not re reaching enough children. We're not reaching them in time. We know that early language development, vocabulary, is one of these kind of key indicators in kindergarten as to readiness and kind of success in literacy and reading and so forth. It's also important for children's social relationships, being able to communicate effectively. It leads to academic success and, of course, again, early literacy skills. Now, there was a study done by Hart and Risley in 1995 where it was a longitudinal study of children zero to four where they looked at the number of words children hear across different socioeconomic classes, and they had this incredibly striking finding of a 32 million word gap between professional families and low-income families. Now, of course, if children are hearing that fewer words, you can imagine their comprehension of these words, understanding what they mean, their connections of words to other words 
is really impaired. So when they're starting to try to learn to read, they're just seeing words on the page. They're not making the mental connections upon what that means. So there's a real huge, again, societal need for this as well. So we've been developing technologies in our lab, learning companion robots that are really designed to interact with young children almost more like a peer. Now, if you look at a lot of innovation that's happening in technology and education today, it's typically happening for older kids, things like Khan Academy. If you look at these sort of virtual tutors, they tend to be taking, again, this sort of authority, tutor role, teaching physics, teaching calculus to, you know, often high school, older kids. This is really about trying to push it down to a much younger kid where now you think about the social, the effective, the tangible, all these things really matter. The other thing that's been changing over the years is now we have these incredibly powerful smartphones. So we've actually been building these robots around smartphones so that they can be much more robust, much less expensive, and you can build them be kind of fluffy and appealing. So I'm going to show you um, a video of a story companion robot that helps children learn vocabulary by embedding targeted vocabulary in the stories that it shares with children. It's a story sharing game, so I'll let you see how that, that looks. So there's an app that have kind of like these digital stick figures that you can move around. And children can narrate a story as they move these characters around. Or the robot can narrate a story as it kind of virtually moves these characters around. And so you have this little table. You put a tablet in. So first, the robot tells a story. A little penguin named George lived in the South Pole. Hi. I'm a baby dragon. See my wings? Yeah. Go ahead. You tell a story. I want it to be about a snowman. Ooh. Once upon a time, there was a snowman, and he was alive. Will you play with me again? Yes. So this is happening over an eight-week period. So you can see as time goes on, children are starting to relate to the robot differently, right? He was covered in blue, and he had a dog and a cat. So you see their stories becoming more elaborate. You're seeing them touching the robot more, this physical aspect. I'm a scary dinosaur. I will be king of all the dinosaurs. start to see more collaborative things too where the children turn the tablet around <coughs> and encourage the robot to take its turn as well. So pushing the tablet towards the robot, showing it, you know, putting it into perspective so the story's <coughs> upright for the robot. And then of course sitting next to the robot, right? So this kind of very, very physical, very sort of again almost companion animal like like interaction. Your turn. I'm gonna tell us Snowman. Ooh. Once upon a time, there was there were two penguin sisters. <laughs> One. I'm so excited. <laughs> She's like doing a loco kind of gesture there. So anyway, so children, of course, loved interacting with this robot. It was you know a, a long-term study over a period of, of eight weeks. And of course, one of the questions we had is not only was it really engaging over that period of time, which is critical for any learning technology to sustain children's engagement, and I think you can see that their engagement actually increased in richer and richer ways over time, which is really encouraging to see. But of course, what's the learning outcome? So what we could see then is that children, in fact, did learn new vocabulary through interacting with the robot. So as opposed to doing flashcards and so forth, children were picking up the vocabulary through the context of the stories. They were starting to incorporate those same target words in their own stories as they shared with the robot. One other thing that we explored is the robot as peer. What happens if you match the learning level 
of the children's complexity of the stories with the complexity of the stories the robot tells. And what we found is that if you match the complexity, children actually even learned even more. So if you had children that told simpler stories and the robot told simpler stories, children would have a greater vocabulary gain, more complex stories, more complex stories, more vocabulary gain. So again, really intriguing to think about robots now as learning companions for young children to bootstrap these key skills. Another thing I wanted to touch on is this different aspect of learning. So there's kind of the subject matter, vocabulary, and so forth. But what about other things that lead to success? Things like being curious or having a positive mindset. We know that children, adults can model this for each other and pick up on this. What if a, mo a robot com learning companion could play a game with a child and model pro-curious behaviors? Do you start to see children pick up on that and exhibit more pro-curious behaviors themselves? So this is a really intriguing question, right? So this is a different robot. It's still leveraging this DragonBot platform, smartphone, again, in the face mask. It's now playing a different story game with the child. And the robot has a different role. So the child is actually able to teach the robot words. So we invited children to come into the lab. Now when the children move characters around on the tablet, the robot actually dynamically generates a story to go along with it. And as the story is being told by the robot, words, the textual words appear on the screen in text, right? And so the robot can ask, it's like, I said the word eats, but I don't know which written word is eats. Can you show that to me, for instance? So this puts the robot as kind of a learner from a child who's, who's more advanced, so to speak. Now, the robot actually took, you know, based on a pretest of vocabulary, the robot's estimating what's the most likely word that the child's doesn't quite know yet, but is on the verge of learning. So this is actually a personalized learning experience as well. And as the robot was doing this, it would exhibit behaviors of curiosity. So it would ask questions. It would exhibit enthusiasm about learning new things. Um, it would, uh, you know, again, elicit questions from, the ch from children. It would support things like free exploration. And so the question then is, after they interacted with the robot and we did these specific measures, could we actually see if children were picking up on these similar behaviors themselves? Were they exhibiting them more, right? So could they, in some sense, catch curiosity from a robot? And we had a number of tasks in order to measure that um, during these, these three different kinds of tasks. So what did we find? We found, in fact, that children could catch curiosity from a robot. So this is, again, really intriguing. And especially was intriguing because the robot only exhibited two of the kinds of curiosity that we measured. The third, the robot didn't exhibit. What we find is that children only exhibited the kinds of curiosity that the robot exhibited. They didn't exhibit the kind of curiosity the robot did not exhibit, right? So it was very specific, right? The other thing that we found that was intriguing is we did a part where now the robot wasn't present at all and it was just a tablet. And children tended to have higher learning gains when interacting when the robot was present than when it wasn't. So again, again, the social, physical properties of the robot seems to really matter. So this is really intriguing. So again, with social robots, learning is less like just playing a game app. It's more like learning with friends. It's more playful. Very intriguing. So now I want to kind of touch on, um, I'm going to wrap this up, and I want to touch on some of the kind of ethical concerns, right? So, the big question here, or the big message here, is that social robots bring high touch to high, tu high tech for this much more humanized engagement. And humanized does not mean trying to make the robots more human, per se. There's a lot of assumptions that we're trying to make robots more human, identical. That's really not what this is about. Humanized really means how can you so holistically support human experience, the social, emotional, cognitive, and embodied aspect of experience. Because if you do that, kids, people actually do better. It actually supports our ability to learn, to engage better, and so we have better outcomes. So, you know, this question again, should robots have emotions in the big picture? You know, I'm not going to argue that any robot today has emotions, but it's an intriguing question in the bigger sense, right? You know, so you could say, based on these early findings, this kind of historical perspective, it's intriguing to say maybe yes, for the same reasons that we have emotions, right? To improve our intelligence, our capabilities, to learn from each other, to communicate, to collaborate, makes a lot of sense, right? But there are ethical concerns that are voiced in the media um, by people in the field that, of course, are also worthy of being considered and thought about. Because any technology that could have profound impact on people's lives, the technology is the technology, right? How you apply it could be great or could be not great, right? So there's a lot of insight and wisdom I think we need to have around a dialogue and how we use these technologies to their best advantage. So here's a number of concerns that I've heard voiced over time. 
You know, one is around this notion of authenticity. Robots aren't human, so how valuable in some sense can an experience be with a robot if it's not, if it's not like, if it's, if it's not human enough? There's a whole series of them that relate to, in some sense, the use of robots in society. So will such robots, will we love them so much in some sense? Will they replace human relationships? Will they take the role of care professionals and start to reduce the amount of human contact with care professionals? And that could be an issue. You know, will it change how we interact with other people? You know, there's arguments that social media, Twitter, texting, something that's changing how kids interact with other kids. You know, could this be a case of robots? Um, and if people do form these emotional connections to robots, you know, could that be exploited? You know, so you could argue that, you know, you can use this emotional connection to help promote benefit to people, but, but the opposite could potentially also be true. So I want to take a moment to talk about relationship value and just to acknowledge that we already know that we can get a lot of value from our non-human relationships. When you think about companion animals, right? Your dog is not human, your dog does not have human emotions, and yet you do get a lot of value out of that kind of relationship. So it's intriguing to think about a robot's not human, but value perhaps could still be derived from that interaction. When we think about authenticity, you know, if you think about some of these science fiction movies as a thought experiment, you know, if you've, I don't know how many of you have seen Big Hero 6, but Baymax is this healthcare companion robot that never says feeling states to, to Hero, the boy here. It doesn't profess to have emotions, but it's a steadfast healthcare companion. So everything it does is about the benefit and welfare of the boy hero, right? So through those interactions, through the behaviors, through the decisions the robot makes, there is a sense of emotional connection that forms, right? So this is a question in terms of when we talk about emotions as feeling states in the experiential, saying robots don't feel emotions, therefore they're not interesting, versus thinking about these behavioral decision-making, overt aspects of this thing, you know, how are we gonna weigh the value of these things, I think is an interesting question. And to the extent that these feeling states motivate behaviors, bias decision making, there are other kinds of effective mechanisms you've kind of seen in this earlier work, where although robots don't experience feelings the way we do, there can be these influences that bias the robot to exhibit these kinds of behaviors and make these kinds of decisions that are, you know, similar analogous to emotion-inspired processes, right? And I think the big picture is what we're seeing through all these interactions, studies that we've been doing with people in the real world, is robots are actually offering a very new kind of relationship, right? So you've seen through the weight management robot, it can take aspects of human kind of relationships, like a you know, health coach. It can take on aspects, of course, as an internet connected device, right? But as you can probably see in the learning companion work, it can also take on properties almost like a companion animal. And what we're seeing is that people kind of put social robots at the intersection of these. So it's going to be a new, a new kind of relationship that's really not about replacing our human relationships or relationships with the companion animals, but offering value that's new and unique that it can, again, can engage and help promote benefit to people. I think that's the really exciting opportunity with social robots. So for the rest of it, which is around kind of use of robots, I think you know, it's worthwhile to start thinking through and articulating guidelines, right? So, Social robots are really about partnership. They're not about replacing people. You know, the old idea of robots was kind of replacing people being, you know, compatible, so to speak. That's really not what this work is about. This is really about building robots that work in partnership and enhance our human relationships, enhance our abilities to do things for ourselves. Social robots should really support human empowerment, right? They should help us to better ourselves. That's really what you're seeing in these works with the weight management and with the learning. These robots are helping engage our human capacity to help us improve ourselves. Um, I think one of the intriguing things about robots is that they're distinctly not human. It's how their capabilities, how this relationship is different from our known relationships, different from our human capacities to help supplement and enhance ours. And then, you know, how we behave towards each other, how we behave to other technologies like social robots, how we behave towards companion animals, I think all of this actually really matters. You know, it's like social robots don't dehumanize us, technology doesn't dehumanize us, kind of our actions or misbehaviors are what dehumanizes us, right? So I think we just need to be very cognizant about how we behave it really does matter, whether it's through a human other or not quite human other, right? And, you know, I think social robots need to be designed to be honest about what they can do, what they can't do. They shouldn't profess to have feelings that they don't have, right? You see toys do this. I don't think it makes any sense. I don't see what the value out of that is. So robots should be very honest in the way that they're designed, very transparent in their design. And I think if we do that, when we think about how social robotics is evolving across all of these different domains, from manufacturing and elder care and health care and learning and so much more that we talked about, 
I think we can expect to see this as a technology that can really proliferate into the world around us. So when we think about, again, how is a social or personal robot revolution going to happen, I see it happening very differently than kind of what we've seen in the past, right? So we see these very expensive kind of industry robots that can do things on kind of multiple uh, capacities within a physical competence, like the ability to manipulate objects. You can do manufacturing tasks. If you can locate from point A to point B, you can do navigation tasks, right? But they're really kind of constrained by that physical competence, right? When we think about consumer robots in the home, we've had one case of kind of single niche robot appliances. They only vacuum, they only mop, for instance. We've seen this other dimension of kind of, again, this emotional engagement, this companion animal-like engagement, but no functional utility, right? So things like Paro, Ibo, and things like that. There's a huge potential now, I think, to be in that upper right quadrant, which is multi-purpose utility and deep emotional engagement. And that's really what Jibo is doing, my startup is doing. We're now reviewing robots, social robots, as a new kind of content platform for enlivening all kinds of content in a new way with greater human engagement. And if you think about social robots now as a platform, much like you think about a smartphone or a tablet as a platform with multiple apps, in this case maybe robots have multiple skills, now you have a social robot in the home that can do many, many things for you. And I think that's really how we can think about how the personal robot revolution is really going to kick this off. This is your house. So this is g -Bow. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back, so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in. <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey, one. they make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. <laughs> Good night, Jibo. Jibo, this little bot of mine. All right, so that's Jibo coming your way. <laughs> coming your way. All right, then, just to, to wrap up, then, then, then what is the big, big picture here? When you think about technology, our relationship with technology, we've been on this curve, right, of Technology is tool. You know, we started with the computer and the internet, and it's all about how do we democratize the access to information, making it more ready at hand, more convenient. You know, now we're having wearables and so forth. But we've talked about there's these whole other set of real important societal challenges where high-touch engagement really matters, and we need technology to help bridge the gap because there's literally not enough human resources institutions to bridge that gap. But it needs to be technology of the right kind. It needs to have technology 
that can provide this high touch engagement to be the most effective, right? This social emotional side. So social robotics in many ways is so disruptive, is so compelling, because it does bring high tech and high touch together. And in doing so, whoops, let's go back. Ah, my time presents has died, no, no, no. Okay, let's try to bring it up again. Is it back up? Back up, back up. Let's try that again. Let's try the build again. Is it gonna work? One more build. There it is, okay, good. <laughs> so in doing so, we can imagine a different kind of relationship with technology. It's much more like a helpful companion versus just a tool where the promise of it is democratization of access to humanized services and support. Again, where robots aren't replacing human care professionals, they're not replacing people, they're enhancing, they're extending, they're augmenting. So again, you know, what is this really about? What, what am I passionate about? I'm passionate about creating technologies for human transformation. I am passionate about creating technologies that help people become the people they aspire to be, to try and attain a quality of life for themselves and their family. I believe to really do that, you need to have high touch and high tech come together because our human capacities for transformation are not just cognitive. When we think about technology today, about data, 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 that's not, it's only a piece of the story, it's just the cognitive piece. We need the social, the emotional, the cognitive, and the physical. And that's what social robotics means. It brings all of these things together to make us more successful. That's why social robotics, I think, has meaning to you, to everyone, and why I think social robotics is gonna change the world. So with that, I will end. Thank you. You guys have some questions? Okay, we have time for just a couple really quick questions. Uh, if you guys want to go ahead and bring up the first one. All right, the first question is, why did you choose Jibo to have few physical features compared to Leonardo? Yeah, so this is a really intriguing question. It's, it's actually a great question. And it really gets down to this mind shift about robots from being something that's explicit about a physical competence to a platform for content. So we think about a robot that's a platform for content, the abstraction of it to still be anthropomorphic and expressive in the right way, but enough of a blank slate that you have a lot of freedom for other people to come on and use those attributes to apply different kinds of app skills, services. That's why it's an abstraction of kind of like a more explicit humanoid embodiment. And so it's a very intentional aspect of the design. All right, the next question is from Jocelyn Miller. And she asks, what about gendered AI effect and embodiment? What is your take on the way social robots engage or deploy gender? Yeah, so this is a really great question. It's, really, uh, it's a really intriguing one. So we've actually done um, studies in, at MIT um, with the humanoid robot next to you. You saw her kind of, or, or it flash up on a couple of these slides. It's that white humanoid robot where you can, it's designed to be kind of ambiguous in its gender on purpose, so depending on the voice you give it, people will gender it male or female. And we've actually done studies where we do that explicit manipulation. So we did a study around persuasion. You know, could a robots be persuasive and what are the paralinguistic cues that make someone or a robot more or less persuasive? And we actually found gender effects there. So males would tend to find the female gendered robot more persuasive and conversely, females tend to find um, the male robot more persuasive. So it's probably gonna depend on task and so forth, but there absolutely are intriguing gender effects and it should be an important consideration um, in design. All right, this next question comes from Daniel and he wants to know if robots are gonna teach children and learn from them and mortality comes up, who decides the ethics they're taught? Morality comes up. So, you know, again, I think one of the, for me, the most exciting things about social robots is how they bring together people. You know, when I'm at home and my kids get a tablet, they stick their nose in it and they walk off, and I'm like, honey, I'm still talking to you. But with these social robots, what you find is it becomes a group dynamic where mom or dad sit down and they engage with their child and their robot as a very rich triad where the parent is also participating, they're guiding, they're reinforcing, they're modeling, they're drawing the child's attention to the right thing at the right time. So in some ways, the social robot is bringing out excellent teaching practices from the parent. So when you talk about morality, I mean, 
that's what parents need to be teaching their children, right? Which again, is, I think is so important for us to, to have this perspective of robots don't replace, they supplement, they complement. What is important for us to teach, what's our responsibility, should main, we should keep as our, our human responsibility, not offload that to, to these technological systems. So again, this gets down to the use and application of these systems, but it's very important to have this kind of dialogue. Thank you so much. That's all the time we have. How about a big round of applause for Dr. Brazil? Great. Thank you. Thank you. And we're sourcing the ladies that will come to our academy in two avenues. First of all, through other companies that would like to take our program and have us train their ladies, or through the Ministry of Labor and the Human Resources Development Fund. We'll be working with ladies that then don't have jobs. And what we would do is work with almost like preferred vendors and do on-the-job training where they've got two days in our academy and three days on the job.